Hey, it's nine o'clock. Congratulations, you all made it on time. That's, that's pretty awesome. Welcome to MGBC, we're glad to have you with us today. And we'd like to invite you to stand with us as we sing Power in the Blood.
Well, good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Welcome to each and every one of you. You've, uh, you've made it here, even with the time change. I see a few people, yeah, a couple kids yawning over here. They lost out, make up for that hour of sleep this afternoon. It's great to see you. If you're a visitor or a guest with us, we especially want to welcome you. Uh, in the card, the pew rack in front of you, there's a card there. If you would complete that, give us a little information about yourself. We're not going to inundate you, come visit you, knock your doors down. We just want to send you a letter and make sure that you feel welcome here at Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. Over the last several weeks, you've noticed that we've had various ministry moments here in our Sunday morning worship. The purpose of those ministry moments is to make you aware of some of the ministry opportunities and things that are going on in the community around you. In addition to that, we're hoping that God may lead you and or your family to take part and become involved in some of those ministries. Maybe God's calling you to take part as a volunteer or work in a certain capacity in one of these ministries. Uh, today we've invited Linda Banizak from the uh, Morrison's Cove Village. Uh, she is the chaplain over there, and we've asked her to come and share briefly as to what she's doing, what goes on there, and perhaps some ways in which you and or your family can take part in the ministry there. So I'm going to ask her to come forward and share with us. I believe she has some slides, fellas, if you want to go ahead and put those up, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Come on up, Linda. There's your clicker. It is indeed good to be with you this morning. Your worship is wonderful. My name is Linda Banizak, and I am the chaplain and the director of spiritual life at the village. And I bring you greetings on behalf of the residents, uh, your neighbors right across the parking lot, actually, the staff and the board of directors of the village at Morrison's Cove. 100 years ago, in fact, over 100 years ago, folks like you, and me were seeking to follow Christ and serve those in need. And their mission of providing care for aging persons continues to this day. Each year, the village gives nearly $3 million in care to individuals who need assistance but do not have the resources to cover the costs. At the village, meeting the spiritual needs of our residents is an integral part of their care. We minister in Christ's name to the whole person. Our devoted volunteers assist us in providing a wide variety of opportunities that foster spiritual growth. In fact, Pastor Brian is scheduled to be uh, there for Sunday afternoon worship, I believe, on July 6th. Please come and join the residents for worship. There are probably 80 residents that gather for worship each Sunday afternoon. Volunteering is about building relationships. One of our volunteers shared a story about a little boy named Marcus. During the mealtime, Marcus's family typically says prayers for people they know. After spending the day with his grandmother, Marcus came to the dinner table and he was adamant that his family pray for the folks that he and his grandma spent time with that day. With perfect enunciation, he named his new friends, Perditha, Ella, Jeanette, and Gayla. Marcus insisted that they pray for each one. Those names are very familiar to us at the village. You see, Marcus's grandmother is Geraldine. She is our village at Morrison's Cove plant lady, and she also does spiritual care visits with our residents. Some days, she asks Marcus whether he wants to begin the prayer when they are visiting a resident. Well, Marcus is happy to begin the prayers. In fact, he can say Perditha with perfect clarity. You need to know that at the time, Marcus was not yet three years old. This is one example of how volunteering in Christ's name transforms lives. Today, I invite you to pray 
consider volunteering at the village, you might be surprised how your life and the lives of your own family are changed. Our needs at the village are great, and the opportunity to touch lives in the name of Christ are as numerous as your spiritual gifts. And you have them. I see them. No matter what your age, there is a way you can make a difference. Can you lead singing? Can you assist residents in creating a new banner for our chapel? Can you come and simply visit and read scripture with a resident whose eyesight is failing? Can you bring a child and simply pray with a brother or sister in Christ? When we serve in Christ's name, lives are transformed. If you are interested in volunteering, you can find the, my contact information on the pink sheets located at your information center out here. And I do thank you for this opportunity of sharing our mission at the village. You are a wonderful fellowship. Thank you for these moments. Thank you. Chris, thank you. I have had the opportunity to work with uh, Linda several times over uh, the last couple of years, and it's always a privilege. Uh, everything is done in a professional manner, in a Christ-like manner, and I greatly appreciate that. So if you have the opportunity and you feel God calling you and leading you uh, to connect with uh, the village, please contact her. Take your children over there. What a great opportunity to minister to those folks uh, with your family as you, as you go and visit. And we thank you for sharing with us this morning. Uh, now we have a special announcement of a special group that's coming here, a special um, presentation, performance next month coming here. So Kylie, if you want to come forward, uh, we'll make that announcement. Good morning. Um, on Friday, April 11th, um, at 7 p.m., there will be a concert here in the sanctuary. Um, Shippensburg University Concert Choir and Madrigals are coming, and we are composed of 54 singers. There's 32 women and 22 men, which we all will need host homes from you. So if you can be a host family, you can contact Shirley Stoltz or Deb Malott, um, my mother. And... Um, We'll be singing sacred and secular, secular music. Just one of our popular medleys is from Les Mis, so if you know that, you might like to come. Um, uh, Madrigals, we are compo we're composed of 19 singers from the concert choir, and we are going to France next week. So I'll be going to France, I'm really excited. But um, we're traveling there with that, and we're going to sing our songs that we were singing in France in the cathedral. So we're, we're doing four different concerts, and um, we're doing those songs here as well. So those are all sacred songs. And um, yeah, so if you would like to come, or if you can be a host family, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, if you would like to be involved with that, please make sure you contact Shirley uh, or myself. We can we can get you into that situation. We could be a, a host family. Uh, announcements. If you have not become involved in the E100, it's not too late. There's E100 cards out there, and the bulletin board is posted over here. Make sure that you sign up and put your name up on there uh, on the bulletin board. I would also like to draw your attention to something that we kind of get lost in the shuffle. If you look at your bulletin on the back cover of your bulletin is the family corner. And sometimes what happens is with respect to the family corner, we forget that it's there. But I want to draw your attention to this because the children are learning about heaven over in children's church. And some of the questions that they have been asking about heaven might be interesting topics of discussion around your dinner table or breakfast table. Things like, do pets go to heaven? And what's some of the other things, Danny, that they, they've been asking you? Where did Lazarus go when he, you know, when he died and then he was resurrected from the tomb? Where did he go in that process? So, some of those things might be interesting discussion around your table. So just want to draw your attention to that. 
Finally, a communion reminder. On April 13th, we will have communion here following the Sunday morning service. We're going to have it after the Sunday morning service again on April 13th. Now, Lamersville will be providing child care for us that morning, and we exchange child care with them, and they're having their communion the same day in the evening. So if you are able to assist Lamersville in covering their child care over at the Lamersville Church on April the 13th, please see myself or Danny. We'd like to connect you and, and get you set up with that because we are going to exchange child care so that their folks and our folks can all equally take part in communion. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask Danny and his wife and family to come on up. Spencer and Sarah. Sa yeah, she's here. Okay, very good. As well as the elders. And I think we're missing a couple of elders. I think Garth, is Garth here? I know that he was not feeling well yesterday. So we're missing a couple of elders. Uh, I'm going to let you briefly describe, Danny, what you're doing. You're taking a trip to Haiti, but I'm going to turn it over to you, and then we'll go from there. And how many minutes did you say I had? I, when, I, when I start talking about Haiti, do you remember what happened the last time? Okay. It's 920. Um, well, I'm teaching in children's church today, so, uh, well, yeah. Um, no, we're going to Haiti um, two weeks from yesterday. We will be going. Um, we're going back to the same place we went two years ago. Um, our neighbor two doors down is uh, a mission. Our missionaries, our, the family is missionaries in Haiti. Um, they're involved with, um, they're affiliated with the um, Church of God in Roaring Spring. And we got to be good friends with them. They kept bugging us to come to Haiti. And we went two years ago. And um, the kids were really pushing hard to go back, so we're going back. Um, um, we're going to be making, one thing we're going to be doing, the main thing we're going to be doing is making desks um, for a church. Um, the Roaring Spring Church of God has a sister church. It's kind of up in the mountains. It's in a rural area. Um, we went up there last time. They told us uh, when we went that they had just fixed the road up. Um, I couldn't tell, but they said they had, and it was much worse before that. I thought, well, you would have needed, uh, I don't know, something beyond a Hummer to get up there. But anyway, we made it. But um, it's, uh, the, it's a church during Sundays and in, on, uh, during the week. It's a school, and it's just a, a, basically a, what, a, a round circle, a small room, and they have school in there in the day, but they don't, they don't have desks. They don't have any desks for the kids to work on. So one thing that we're, the main thing that we're going, we're going to be building desks, and as most of you know, I'm very skilled with uh, carpentry and uh, anything like that, so I will be leading the, pro now I think Spencer will be leading the project. He's probably better than me. But uh, now that's one thing we're going to be doing. Um, there are, I believe, 12 or 13 of us. Uh, we're just part of a team that's 12 or 13 folks. Um, that's one thing we're going to be doing. We're going to be delivering those desks, interacting with the people there, um, going on prayer walks, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what else. Um, using opportunities wherever God puts us, wherever we see. I know we'll be probably be visiting some hospitals there, which uh, we did the last time as well. And... Um, I'm not sure what else, but we're looking forward to interacting with the Haitian people, and uh, it's it's just a neat a neat time. Hopefully, we'll get to do what we did last time, which was one of the highlights I thought was going out and delivering water to farmers working in the field, and just giving them water and saying God bless you, with no strings attached. And you should see their faces when they they all look and see what are these guys. You can see them talking to them. Say, what are they doing? And then they show up, and you have something for them with nothing. You know, we just wanted to cool you off. Of course, it's, you know, 85, 90, whatever it is there, and they're happy to have the water, and they get a big smile on their face, and they, they, they're they happy to have you there. So we're, we're looking forward to what God's going to do through us in Haiti. And I just want to say also thank you to all, all of you folks who have supported us in prayer and financially and will continue to support us as we're, as we're there. We'll be there for a week starting now, two weeks from Saturday and through the following, following Saturday. So that's what we're doing. Good. Well, join us in prayer. Doug's going to lead us in prayer as we pray uh, a prayer of commitment to Danny and his family uh, as they do a missions trip down to Haiti. Okay, let's pray. Lord, again, we just know in your word, in Matthew chapter 28, that you command us to go and make disciples of all nations. And it's exciting to see that Danny and Cheryl and Sarah and Spencer are willing to be obedient to that command. Lord, I pray that you would watch over them as they travel 
I also pray that you would prepare the hearts of those people that they're ministering to. Lord, we know that you want us to spread the gospel to the ends of the world, and we pray that uh, you would just uh, give Danny and Cheryl opportunities to do that. I thank you for this church and, and their love for the lost, and I thank you for their support. I also pray that uh, you would just uh, be with the rest of the team as they're traveling, and just give them safety. Lord, again, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given the Hortons, and we pray that you would bless them in all that they do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the ushers, if they're ready, will come on forward to take this morning's offering. I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that this coming Friday, the pastoral staff, Pastor Adam, myself, as well as our families, along with all of the elders and their families, will be taking a missions trip to Urban Hope. We will be spending the weekend in Philadelphia uh, at the Urban Hope Center ministering. We're going to be making uh, some food and taking it to the homeless and doing a variety of other ministry opportunities. So we're going to take this time here for offering to pray for uh, the staff, the pastoral staff, as well as the elders as we travel uh, and do a ministry trip over at um, Urban Hope there in Philadelphia. So men, if you would come on forward, we'll go ahead and pray for this morning's offering. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've provided. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly gave up his life uh, to demonstrate love, compassion, grace, and to reconnect us with a relationship with you. Father, as we go to uh, Philadelphia uh, this week to Urban Hope Center, I pray that we will be able to clearly demonstrate that grace, that mercy, that hope that you have so uh, given to us uh, to demonstrate to those uh, that we work with. I pray that you'll provide us with safety, with direction, uh, that we may be filled with your spirit to share the love of Jesus Christ with those that are lost. Um, and now we ask your blessing upon this morning's offering. I pray that it will be used to further the gospel message throughout the world. In thy name we pray. Amen.
this morning the desperate spot we're in and how much we need you. God, open our hearts, open our minds to your word this morning. And may you use a, a broken vessel like me to communicate it well. Lord, use my mouth this morning. May it only communicate your words. In your name I pray. Amen. Children, you're dismissed out that door, please. If you could open your Bibles to the book of Galatians, we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. If you're using the Pew Bible, that's page 631. That was even single file, that was impressive. So, we're going to look at Galatians 2, 14 through 19. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Can I just admit to you that, that reading through Galatians through the lens that I think we're supposed to look at it through, through the lens of the gospel has been like just tearing me up. It, it's, it's tearing down misunderstandings that I've had. It's, it, it's helping me see the scripture for the way we're supposed to see it, through the lens of the gospel. I remember thinking in college when I took a class on Galatians, why in the world was Paul so upset? Like he just, he seems, he seems kind of crabby. 
and even, even kind of arrogant in Galatians if you don't understand why he's so upset. And when I started to unpack, when God started to unpack in my heart and in my life that Jesus is the main character in all of Scripture, and through that lens, being able to see the, the Word of God, it, it, it meant something different to me. And so I just want to admit to you that as I'm going through Galatians, this stuff is just sort of, it, it's super exciting to me, it's super convicting. I, I can't sing a song, I, can't, I don't even know if I'll be able to get through the lyrics, I can't sing the song, I need you, oh I need you, anymore without crying. Because I understand my spot without Jesus. And it tears me up to think that I try to live, I, 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 I do and I have tried to live without it. And so this morning, please know that this message is coming from a, uh, a place of, of excitement and a place of concern. A place of concern meaning that I think this is the thing we as a church misinterpret about the gospel most often. I know that's a bold statement, but I think what we're going to talk about today is the section in Galatians that if we understand this, if we can wrap our heads around this and start to live this, then the rest of it's going to flow out a lot more naturally. I've been lining people up that I trust and that I know will pray for me. I've been asking them throughout the week, pray for me this Sunday. Because I, f I feel a weight in communicating this truth this morning. And that's not a bad thing, just so you know. God's Word's powerful. And I think for a lot of years in my life, I didn't allow it to have the power in my life that it should have had. And so I praise the Lord for, in my 30s, giving me children. And through Isaiah, and through reading the Word to Isaiah, that's what made the Word start to come alive to me in a whole new way. And I beg God that I can live out the gospel in a way that he understands it differently than I understood it. Not that my parents did a bad job, because they didn't. But I just want to get this right. So I had to ask myself, and I had asked myself several times in the past, but I think this is the first time I really get it. Why was he so upset? And Brian talked about Peter and, and how he got confronted and Peter's hypocrisy last week. And I had to ask myself, it had to be a deeper issue than just hypocrisy that made Paul so upset. It had to be something deeper than that because Paul was really angry. Angry enough to defy common practice by confronting him corporately. So something deeper than hypocrisy was really getting under Paul's skin and it jumps out at us in verse 14. It says, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. You see, the beginning of the verse has the word but, that's a transition term. He's trying to change our, change our focal point from one point to another. You see, we see earlier that there's hypocrisy, and we see that it's even led Barnabas, uh, a leader in the, in the church, it's led him astray. But this transition word gives us the answer as to the root reason why this is getting confronted. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I confronted. And so I, I started to examine this. And if you go back to the book of Acts, Acts 10, and that's on page 597 in your pew Bible if you're interested in going back and looking at it. In Acts 10, something remarkable happens in Peter's life that I think fuels the fire for Paul. When Peter, of all people, does this, it fuels the fire as to why he's... he's his, his, upsetness, if that's a word, uh, reaches a whole new boiling point. You see, in 
in chapter 10 of Acts, and we're not going to read the whole thing. I just want you to see what's happening here. This is Peter's vision. If you don't know what that means, uh, let me just explain it to you a little bit. There, at that time, there were ceremonial food laws, and Jews weren't supposed to eat certain foods, and the Gentiles didn't follow those rules. That's basically the, the nuts and bolts of it. Peter was a Jew. So starting in verse 9, it says, The next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing his food, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being led down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, a verse like that makes uh, a guy like Jay Stern really happy because it says, Rise, kill, and eat. Okay? But, uh, but what's happening here is this huge monumental shift because God's trying to make the gospel abundantly clear to Peter and say there's no lines anymore there is no Jew and Gentile there's no rules on the food there's no man-made rules anymore that I uphold there's none of that go there's no unclean or clean anymore the thing that really stands out to me is right after this he gets woken up by a servant of Cornelius, who's a Gentile, that says God met him, an angel met him, and said to him, go get Peter and bring him here. So Peter goes and eats and dines with Cornelius, and throughout the book of Acts, we see that Peter is criticized several times for sitting and eating with the Gentiles, eating Gentile food. And so he, right after this vision, he, he actually goes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius' whole family surrenders over to the gospel, and he sees this big movement among the Gentiles. And later on, throughout Acts, two or three times, we see people get upset with him for eating the Gentile food and taking part of the Gentile practices because he understood it. Well, in Galatians, I mean, in Antioch then, what Paul's confronting here is that you, you of all people, Peter, you knew this. You of all people know that there's no lines anymore. So you say one thing over here and you don't live it up over here. So out of all the people at that time, Peter understood the truth of the gospel was for everyone. He understood it more than most. In Galatians 2, we see that Paul was willing to confront publicly because Peter was not living in line with the truth of the gospel. So what's the truth of the gospel? You've got to understand that part to understand where he goes next, what we're talking about today. You have to understand that part. The main reason they were confronted was they weren't living in line with the truth of the gospel. So what, what, what part of the truth of the gospel, what is the truth of the gospel that they needed reminded of? And we get our answer in the next section of verses. The word is justification, and it does not come from our obedience to the law. The definition of the word justification literally means the action of declaring or making righteous in the sight of God. That's a theological definition. Outside of that, it's a legal term. Okay, so why was this such a big deal? Why was this such a big deal? Well, let's unpack this. Because this is a game changer, folks. In the Old Testament, you sought out your righteousness through sacrifice and obedience to the law. That's how your justification happened, through your righteous... You, you, you sought out righteousness through sacrifice and obedience to the law. And in the Old Testament, we see God's wrath on full display. I mean, think about this. Think about the, the banishment from the garden. He took sin very seriously. Shortly thereafter, we see a flood that literally kills everybody but Noah's family. We see Sodom and Gomorrah getting destroyed because of sin. We see the ground swallowing up some of the Israelites because of sin and disobedience. 
We see God's wrath on full display. So people saw this God very much. That they also saw that this God was very much in love with them, and he went to great lengths time and time and time again to prove to them this great love. Think about how many, how many times he was patient with the Israelites throughout the Exodus story. He proved time and time and time again how much he loved them. They, they, the Old Testament people also saw how serious he was about dealing with sin. You'll remember the story of Achan in, in Jericho, and if you don't, look that up. And several other stories. God took sin very seriously in the Old Testament. We saw his love, we saw his wrath. We saw it throughout the Old Testament. But the world still hadn't seen an outpouring of God's love and God's wrath like the people that stood on that hill in Golgotha the day Jesus died. You see, that day changed it. You see, when Jesus died, the full and total wrath of God was poured out on him. Never before had God allowed so much wrath towards sin be poured out at one time, including the flood. Never before had God allowed his wrath towards sin to be poured out on mankind like the moment Jesus died. And all of that wrath, every bit of it, past, present, and future, was poured out on his very own son. Our sin and the sin of all mankind was dealt with that day, and every bit of it was carried to and on the cross by Jesus. And that sin was so ugly and so repulsive that God, for the first time ever, could not look, even look, at His one and only Son. You see, Jesus willingly took that burden and suffered that wrath. And I feel heavy thinking about what that felt like. I mean, I just want you to picture God's wrath. I want you to picture that, that with a word, with a word, the whole earth is covered in water and everyone, everyone, but no one in his family dies. Everyone. The whole world, dead. That's how serious God's wrath was. The Israelite nation, the ground opens up and swallows a bunch of them up. That's how serious God was about sin. Sodom and Gomorrah, a whole city given over to sin. And God said, I'm going to destroy it with fire. And as an act of grace, I'm going to allow you to leave, some of you. But if you even look, if you even for one second look back at that city and long for what's in there for one little bit, you'll die too. Don't even look. Leave. And Lot's wife looks back, it's dead. God's wrath is serious business, and the wrath, that wrath, that ugly wrath, that horrible, horrible, weighty punishment wrath of God times a billion piled and heaped on the shoulders of Jesus on the cross. Think of what that must have felt like. And he did it willingly. And a big word I'll teach you this morning propitiation happens. And that word means turning God's wrath away from us. Turning God's wrath away from us. We deserved it. We deserved the full tilt wrath of God. We deserved that. And, and God's wrath was turned away from us toward Jesus and in that moment, the wrath of God was satisfied. The sacrificial system goes away because the perfect spotless sacrifice, the only one that could handle all of our sin, Jesus, died on the cross. And when he rose from the dead, Jesus ushered in a whole new way of relating to God and a whole new motivation. See, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're not going to suffer God's wrath Jesus did that for you. That is what Paul has to remind the Galatians of here. And I believe we need a reminded of it too. 
You see, our justification doesn't come from our adherence to the law. I call it checklist Christianity. And we all fall into the trap. That if I do these things, then I'm a good Christian. And if I don't do these things, then I'm a good Christian. But if you do do the things that I don't do, then you're a bad Christian. And if you don't do the things that I do, then you're a bad Christian. And so we call our, it's a checklist. And then we turn it into a competition. And we try to say that, that I'm a better Christian than you. I'm a better follower than you. I can compare myself to you. And that's some of the same trap that Peter was falling into. Tim Keller says in his book, Galatians for You, socially polished Christians feel uncomfortable around believers who are socially awkward or marginal and vice versa. We may feel uncomfortable around people whose cultural emphasis are different to ours, and we may respond to all this as Peter did in apparently well-mannered ways. We politely sit by those other people in church, but we won't eat with them. We won't really become friends with them. We won't socialize with them, sharing our lives and homes and things with them. We will keep relationships formal and see them at official church meetings only. All this comes from not living in line with the gospel. Without the gospel, our hearts have to manufacture self-esteem by comparing our group with other groups. But the gospel tells us we are all unclean without Christ and all clean in Him. I think that's huge. So it's no longer a comparison game. It's no longer you and I saying that we've got this figured out and they don't. Or we're a better church because we do this and they don't. That's not what the gospel is about, and that's not living in line with the gospel. And a poor understanding of justification will lead to this every time. A poor understanding of what living in line with the gospel is all about will lead to this. Later in the same book, Tim Keller says this, the word justification has a legal reference, and therefore it provides a different perspective on our salvation in Christ. The opposite of clean is polluted. But cleansing isn't sufficient to convey what Christ does for us. Cleanliness alone suggests that God accepts us because Christ cleanses and gets rid of our sinful thoughts and habits. So we become acceptable to God by actually becoming righteous in our attitudes and actions. But the opposite of justified is condemned. Justification means that in Christ, though we are actually sinners, we are not under condemnation. God actually God accepts us despite our sin. We are not acceptable to God because we actually become righteous. We become actually righteous because we are acceptable to God. J.I. Packer says in his book, God's Words, to justify in the Bible means to declare of a man on trial that he is not liable to any penalty but is entitled to all the privileges due to those who have kept the law. Justifying is the act of a judge pronouncing the opposite sentence in con to condemnation, that of acquittal and legal immunity. Justification is God saying you are guilt-free. Justification is God saying your death sentence is canceled out and you deserve a death sentence. And we don't do anything to deserve that. We don't die to the law and stop obeying it. We die to the belief that our obedience to the law will save us. Because we are alive in Christ. See, if we're going to go through this verse by verse. Verse 16 makes a little more sense as you really dig in and read the truth of it. So let's read it again. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 
this verse falls in line with everything else that Paul's been saying. That our justification, our, our uh, acquittal doesn't come from acts of righteousness, doesn't come from us obeying the law. It comes through faith in Jesus. Now, when you get to verses 17 and 18, they're not like that. If you look down at verses 17 and 18, they're not like that. They're, uh, they're a little bit obscure. And there's a commentary I read, and it paraphrases these two verses like this, and I think it'll make more sense. So let me read it from the Scriptures first. It says, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now, it would be really easy for me to preach this message, talk about verse 16, talk about verse 19, and not say anything about 17 and 18 because it's hard for me to understand. Okay? It would be really easy to do that. And believe me, I was tempted. But... As I was reading through some commentaries, I came across a paraphrased version of these two verses, and it popped out at me, so I'm going to read them to you. It says, if someone who knows they are justified by faith sins, is it because justification by faith in Christ promotes sin? Not at all. But if someone who professes faith in Christ keeps on with the same sinful lifestyle, rebuilding the sinfulness that Christ died to destroy the penalty for, making no effort to change, then it proves that this person never really grasped the gospel, but was just looking for an excuse to live in disobedience to God. That makes 17 and 18 make sense to me. That what, what did you get drawn to this for? I meet with some guys for discipleship, and one of the things that we talked about uh, last week is two of the guys that I meet with, they were saved later in life. And um, so... They, um, they came to Christ out of a sense of desperation because they understood the gospel and they understood what they needed. You see, I was raised in the church and raised in a Christian home, so I came to Christ out of expectation. I came to Christ because that's what you do. <laughs> At some point in your life, you raise your hand, you pray a prayer. That's what you do. So I didn't grow up with a clear understanding of my depravity. I didn't grow up with a clear understanding of how lost I was without Jesus. And like I said, it's not because my parents did a bad job. But these two other men that I meet with, they came to Christ later in life. And they came to Christ under completely different circumstances than I came to Christ. See, I had every opportunity afforded to me because I was part of the church. And they had that opportunity available to them also. But later in life, as they experienced life a little bit, they realized, I need this Jesus because everything else feels empty. So the reason behind why you come to Christ is vitally important. The reason why you say you're giving your life to Christ is vitally important. That so what moment where you're answering the question, why am I doing this? I've, I've been at places, I, I, whether it's camp or youth conference or a revival service or whatever, and I've seen lots of people in an emotional state stand up and come forward and make a commitment to God that in their heart they did not mean. And what Paul's trying to remind people of is that if you came to Christ and it did not, it, it, you made no effort to change, then it proves that you never really grasped the gospel in the first place. But you were just looking for an excuse to live in disobedience to God. That's what Paul's saying here. And I think that has huge implications on our lives and on our understanding of the gospel and why we do what we do and what motivates us. 
See, verse 19 then is, is a lot more clear in its, in its uh, writing. Paul says, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And if you read that in context with the other verses that come before and after it, it makes a whole lot more sense. But the same commentator paraphrases this verse like this. He says, the law itself showed me that I could never make myself acceptable through it. So I stopped living to it. I died to it as my Savior. Though I obeyed God before, it was simply to get something from Him. It was for my own sake. Now I obey Him simply to please Him. I now live for Him. So I have to ask myself, what am I living for? Am I living to get something from God, or am I living in response to God? Am I living for God? And this is why Paul is so upset. Because people had come in and twisted the truth and twisted the gospel and allowed people to think that, yes, you do need Jesus, but you still need the rules you have to follow the rules or else God won't find you acceptable anymore. That's the lie. That's the lie. You are never more or less acceptable to God. Jesus died in your place and in my place. You see, this is exactly why in Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. That's the motivation. The motivation to get up in the morning and keep going every day is Christ. Oh, Paul, why did you do that? Christ. Paul, where'd you go there? Christ. That's the motivation behind all of life. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Why is it gain? Because he's in the presence of Jesus. Jesus could be sitting on the top of a tra trash heap somewhere, and it wouldn't matter about the riches and splendor around him. As long as Jesus was there, that's heaven. So what are we living for? Is salvation just our get-out-of-hell-free card? Did I just, was I afraid of hell? And that's the only motivator for me becoming a Christian, becoming a believer, was because I was afraid of an eternal hell? Did I come to know Christ just because I wanted to go to heaven someday? If you were to be sitting at the table and Paul came in, would he confront you? for not living in line with the truth of the gospel. Would he see us, Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church, would he see us as rule keepers or gospel-centered Jesus followers? And there's a difference. Are we looking for, are we looking at our, at our Christian walk as a checklist of do's and don'ts, and as long as I do the do's and don't do the don'ts, then I'm fine? Is that what we're looking at it? If that's the way we're looking at it, we're missing it. We have to understand that there is freedom in Christ. If you remember the video we played, the prison door is unlocked. A lot of us accept Christ as our Savior, and we bring Christ into our life, and we say, I am free in Christ, and then we stay in a prison cell, and we just follow the rules. Open the door and breathe the fresh air of freedom. There's joy in living for Christ, but it only comes from a clear understanding of this stuff. It only comes there. That's where true joy starts to fill in your life. Is when you clearly understand what Jesus dying on the cross means. It doesn't just mean eternity. It means so much. It's everything. It means that Christ, it, you are looked at. 
the same way that God looks at his very own son, that we're clothed in Jesus' righteousness. We now live for Christ, not because we feel obligated to, but because we feel compelled to. Because Christ's love has compelled us to obedience. Sure, you're going to look different than the world. Sure, there's going to be things that you do and you don't do, but they're not motivated out of trying to seek God's approval. They're motivated by showering praise back to Jesus. That Jesus, to love you more means i got to live like this, and I want Jesus to be everything in my life. And when people see me, I want them to see Jesus, which means I'm going to have to live different. I'm going to have to talk different. I'm going to have to make different choices. I'm going to have to date different people. I'm going to have to live my marriage differently, and I'm going to have to watch different entertainment choices, and I'm going to have to try harder at my job, and I'm going to have to actually talk to people about the gospel, and I'm going to have to be different. I'm going to have to stand out. Why? Because I want to look like Jesus, and Jesus definitely stood out. So I'm not living under the rules because I don't feel like God loves me enough or accepts me enough if I don't follow the rules. I follow and obey God's law, and I follow and obey God's, God's rules, if you want to call them that, because I love Him. And because I know he wants what's best for me. And he's saying in his word, if you want to look like me, if you want to act like me, if you want to talk like me. That sounded like the bare necessities. But anyway. Then you obey. Because you are compelled to obedience. Because you love me. Listen, let me say it again. You're not justified. Paul said it. It's said several times in God's word. I'll say it. You are not justified in God's presence because you obey the law. And you are no better than people who don't obey the law if you do obey it. If you are sitting here today and you spend five hours a day in God's word and someone over here spends five minutes, you are no better we are all on the same level. We are all rotten to our core. There is nothing good in us. We are all rotten heaps of garbage, every one of us. We have absolutely nothing to offer this world apart from Jesus. And we don't gain that because we obey. We obey because we've already gained that. And church, if we could get this, if we could understand this and walk out the doors and actually live it, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. And I don't care if you're 8 or 80. I don't care if you've been sitting in the pew for 50 years and hearing the word preached in this church. If you haven't lived like this, you haven't experienced freedom. You haven't opened the prison door, and it's unlocked. And that's a choice that you are making for yourself. You want to experience freedom, then you experience freedom in Christ, understanding that he died a horrendous death, and, and he took on the full wrath of God for you. And when you accept that amazing gift, it changes the way you live. And it changes the way you talk. And it changes what's important to you. And people notice a difference. And you're not following the rules because you feel obligated to. You're following Jesus. And he's softening you. And he's taking off your edges. And he's making you look more like him. And that's the goal. So don't live like this amazing act of love and grace and sacrifice was something that you and I deserved because it was not something that we deserved or merited. We deserve hell. We deserve the worst. And we got God's absolute best. 
in the song before the throne, which we're going to close with today, there's a part in the second part of the song, and it says, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Jesus took what we deserve. And in doing that, God looked at us and said, you are acquitted of all charges. You are guilt-free. Go and live in freedom. You are acquitted of all charges. Go and live in freedom. I'd ask you to bow and, and pray with me. God, may we be a, a people that are marked by our understanding of this. God, that you wouldn't give us a desire to follow the rules. You wouldn't give us a deep-rooted desire to, to be obedient to the law. You would give us a deep-rooted desire to look like you. God, thank you for your love. Thank you that you are the sinless Savior and you died to satisfy God's wrath. You are our perfect, spotless righteousness, the great, unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. My soul was purchased by your blood. My life is hid with you on high, with you, my Savior and my God. As your church stands and sings those words, God, I pray that they are, are coming from hearts that desperately want to serve and obey their master.
so grateful may we live like we are grateful Lord may the doors open may your church go out into the world and may the world see a difference in how we live because we were bought at a very high price by a very perfect and good God thank you for your word Thank you for how alive and active it is thousands of years after it was penned to paper. God, may you convict the hearts of your church and may she be forever changed. In your name I pray, amen.